and <clears throat> pleasure to be here and listen a little bit to the earlier part of the sessions here this morning. Uh, this is clearly a, a, an extraordinarily important topic. Uh, we know of a lot of worries around the world around these questions about both equality and, and social cohesion. And uh, we're living in a period of political crisis, which is to a great extent a trust crisis, uh, a crisis of confidence in relationship to our leaders and our political systems. And of course, I don't have to mention the fact that today in Sweden we don't yet have a government and the, the latest attempt just failed earlier uh, this morning. So um, it is definitely very topical. Uh, what I want to do is uh, a couple of things. I want to start by talking about the Swedish social contract. Now, I just put in the title Nordic social contract. This is always a sensitive matter. You know, uh, Freud had a very nice line about the narcissism of minor differences. And that's very true in a Nordic context, uh, where Norwegians, Swedes, Danes, Finns are always very preoccupied with how they are different and better than the rest. So I usually try to stay away from making Nordic claims. Uh, it's, it's bad enough to make Swedish claims in a sense. So um, uh, let me just say that I think a lot of what I say about Sweden actually does hold true more broadly, even though Sweden is extreme in certain respects. But what I want to do is I want to give you a small little version of uh, what I usually speak about in much longer, namely the Swedish social contract, and then go from there to talk a little bit about some of the current challenges that we face here in Sweden, not least with respect to, to uh, immigration and integration issues. That, of course, is one reason why don't, we don't have a government right now. And then I'll move on finally and tell you a few things, give you some data from our uh, most recent trust barometer, which is a survey, a big survey that we uh, have done now a few times, most recently last year, uh, throughout Sweden at the local level. And I'll give you a little bit of, of uh, uh, news from that, some of which is, is a little bit, uh, perhaps, uh, if not disturbing, at least su suggests the need for some sort of control worry about where we're heading here in Sweden. Uh, there are two concepts that I have used uh, for some time to describe the peculiarity of the Swedish social contract. One is statist individualism. Um, I'll explain it more in a, in a moment, but it's about this close relationship between state and individual that seems to characterize uh, modern Sweden. And uh, one part of that is this kind of remarkable confidence that we have in the state, in rule of law, in our common institutions, which is, from a global perspective, quite stunning. Right? In most countries, for very good reasons, people are very suspicious of too much concentration of power, for example, in states that oftentimes are very corrupt, uh, representing maybe a small group of society and so forth. The other side is this emphasis on the individual, individual autonomy and freedom, which you know is something that is also very central to uh, the value structure uh, and the institutional arrangements in, in Sweden. Uh, at the same time, all of this is only possible to realize in mean, a modern, let's say, welfare society as a political project depends on voters. And we can't really blame what we have on trigger-happy social engineers because we actually have been voting for this system for a very long time. So you need to explain it also from an existential point of view. And that's why I have also introduced this notion of a Swedish theory of love, um, which has to do with what seems to be a very strong preference for relations between other people that are based on uh, principles of voluntariness, equality, and autonomy. So the two of those things you know, work together. Uh, two pictures just to capture um, uh, a, a certain interesting paradox uh, when it comes to, to Sweden and, and in other Nordic countries. Um, the first one is, uh, this business about social trust. Uh, this, these are just pictures. I could have chosen any number of graphs. They all show more or less the same thing. Uh, th this is uh, trying to capture what we call generalized trust based on these two classic questions. Either you trust people in general or you can't be careful enough uh, in dealing with them. And what we see there is that the Nordic countries, uh, along with Netherlands, who in this regard appears to be much like a Nordic country, stick out uh, dramatically here, right? You know, Great Britain, right, that we many of us think is fairly similar to us, we're looking at numbers around 35%. Uh, Nordic countries, it's, you know, 60% and above, although I usually say that this 
figure here for Denmark is probably suspect. There's probably some, some measuring problem with that one. <laughs> but the Swedish one is very, very trustworthy, of course. Now, we can argue about whether trust is a good thing or not, right? Some people would say, right, that there's something about it that has to do with perhaps being too trusting. The dumb Swede was it? a nice concept that was used during the period of immigration uh, to the United States in the late 19th century because Swedes then tended to act in what was perceived to be a kind of a dumb way. You know, they would follow rules, stand in line, when clearly at the individual level it's much, much better to jump ahead, right? But for a society, it is a very good idea, right? Everybody stands to benefit uh, if everybody follows these rules. So most people would say, along with economists, that this involves right, much lower transaction costs in the social life, in the political life, in the economic life. Uh, then this, I would say, is also a, a kind of an idea that sits well with, with a kind of self-congratulatory image that we have of ourselves in Nordic countries. You know, people like you, I'm sure, are like that. You wake up in the morning, you have a cup of coffee, and first thing you think about is, what good can I do for society today? Right? <laughs> well, I'm uh, joking, but there's something there to be said for that. Uh, this is also what we call a sticky structure. Uh, so this is now aggregated data uh, from many surveys over uh, from the beginning of the 80s when we first had this data in Sweden and in, in Europe uh, and then up until the present more or less. We, we, we're re, you know, updating this picture now but it's not going to change dramatically. Two things, again, the Nordic countries stick out in an incredibly dramatic way. I mean, most of the time when you compare rich OECD countries, you need to like special hire people who are really good with statistics to create these kind of scales that allow for some sense of drama. In this case, even a simple historian like myself can produce a dramatic effect. So this is for real. Uh, and we also see the other thing is that not much happens. Uh, there is a lot of stability in these numbers. The, the, the slight uptick in the Nordic countries has to do primarily with the fact that we educate young people longer. And high trust tends to co-vary with things like higher education, a more stable economic situation, and a number of other factors related to this. Um, the other thing, though, which is equally important, is the extent to which Sweden and the Nordic countries stick out when it comes to this emphasis on values connected to the individual. And this is a now pretty famous uh, map from World Values Survey, uh, a map, a global map of values. And what I'm interested in here is primarily to see to what extent different countries value uh, values that are connected right, to the individual. And there are two uh, axes here. The one here, uh, the horizontal one, measures a difference or a tension between so-called survival values over here and self-expression values over here. To some extent, this has mostly to do with differences between poorer and richer countries, so that in poorer countries, for pretty obvious reasons, there is a focus on fundamental resources like clean water, housing, health care, and so forth. Whereas in richer countries like Sweden, for example, uh, we can afford to take all of that more or less for granted and instead think of ourselves as the most important project in the world. Some evil people refer to that as a form of narcissism, and that may be true sometimes, but it could be, like all of you here I'm sure, that you both want to do something uh, of your own life, to realize yourself, have a career and so forth, but do that uh, within the framework of a pro-social project. Right? So there's no necessary contradiction right, between self-fulfillment and being you know, a socially responsible person. Up here, we have a tension between so-called traditional values here and secular rational values up here. Now, the traditional values, they tend to be the values that place primary emphasis uh, on subnational types of collectivities, like the traditional, often patriarchal family, the clan, the ethnic group, uh, the religious group. Right? Uh, very important in many, many parts of the world. That's where you have, form your identity, find your security, that's where you have relations of loyalty and honor and so forth. 
The secular rational values, they tend to be values we can associate with, let's say, the Enlightenment ideas, very important, right, for much of the modern project. And there we instead see that it's thought of as the individual being the base unit in society, in the social contract. Um, one obvious aspect of that, let's say, is voting rights. Now, today, after 1920 at least, we take it for granted that all adults in Sweden can vote. But before that, of course, men voted, so they voted de facto for the whole family. And in many parts of the world, uh, it's still a case that the political systems are based on you know, collective units. It could be religious, ethnic, and otherwise. Um, and those values also tend to hang together with values like gender equality, children's rights, rights of the elderly, and so forth. Right? So it's a cluster of values that hang together. And again, here Sweden sticks out, right? Now the other, you know, our cousins in the other Norwegian, I mean Nordic countries are a little less extreme, but they are right up there also. Okay, so they are extreme in both of these dimensions. So in order to f understand the Nordic or the Swedish social contract, you have to have two balls in the air, right? It's it's you know based on values that are social and expressed through social trust, but it is also a project of individual freedom. Right? And that is, I think, the key. So keeping two balls in the air becomes uh, extraordinarily important. From a trust perspective, <clears throat> this we can understand in terms of what we call the trust radius. Think of trust as a globe or a circle. In the middle, we have the hot core of trust that we have for those we know, those we are close to. That's what we call the particularized trust, trust that we have to members of the family, neighbors, people are in a, some form of other organic community. It could be a, an ethnic community, it could be a religious community. Um, now, and we move towards the edge of the circle, or the surface of the globe, we start to include more and more people in what we can call a community of trust. And when we reach all the way out, we include, at least theoretically, all members of society. And that is what we call generalized trust. And it's a generalized trust that is the, what is really characteristic of the Nordic countries. We also have high particularized trust, but there we are not particularly unique. Now, these two forms of trust, right, they follow different types of logics, right? That is to say, in the one case, the particularized trust that we have for those that we know and are very close to, follow a logic that we can think of as the law of blood, right? Notions of an organic sense of community. Whereas generalized trust that has a focus right, on citizenship, the rule of law, follows that other principle. In Swedish, we would call it land, skamelag, byggas, right? going back to our old uh, law laws from the medieval period, uh, when Sweden sort of makes this move from right, a society built more on rule of blood towards rule of law. So this is the important principle to um, emphasize. Uh, now, one way to think about this is compared on Sweden or the Nordic countries with other Western countries. Now, we forget about the rest of the world now. Let's just look at those that are, in many ways, very similar to ourselves. Democracies, market societies, rich societies in the Western world. Um, and I put up this triangular drama here to capture this. And the point, right, is that in Sweden, the, he, the key axis is that one connecting state and individual. Right? Uh, and I usually say, and I think this is something we talked a little bit about that in the break here with Jesper Reuner, that you know, the, the, the ultimate expression of a high trust society is the willingness to pay tax. Right? I mean, this is a very unsexy fact, but it is the case. Right? It, you know, Sweden and other Nordic countries are among the most highly taxed countries in the world, but with relatively little protest against taxes. Okay, so try explaining that to an American, right? Try to explain that the most popular public agency in Sweden, right, is the tax authority. I was just in Texas, you know, you say something like that, they start looking for their revolver, right? Uh, so this is quite remarkable, but of course it is an expression of the fact that there is a perception of a functioning social contract, that you actually get something back form of investments in a common infrastructure, you know, social rights and so forth. Um, 
So this is a key here. And that's predicated then back to what I said before, that we have this remarkably positive view of the state and our institutions. I mean, it's, it's an enormous asset for a country. Um, now, this relationship is, however, not merely a, a matter of an exchange of money. It also has to do with this business of the Swedish theory of love. Because the modern Swedish project is interesting, because something happened in the 1920s when the Social Democrats first start to assemble power. They still are flirting with what we can think of as classical socialism, right? And they thought, well, maybe we should nationalize the banks and the companies and, you know, follow a kind of more strict socialist idea. Well, they ran into some problems, right? Like the voters didn't like it. Uh, there's a famous election, 1928, and they decide, uh-oh, this is a country full, right, of stingy peasants who love their property. So let's forget about socialism, right? But what they liked was this idea of extending individual freedom. So the modern Swedish projects have, to a great extent, been a question of the state operating to emancipate all individuals, not just men, but women, children, elderly, those with disabilities, from ties of dependency in the traditional patriarchal family and, and many, many parts of civil society, right? Charity organizations, religious organizations, so forth, that were built on these fundamentally hierarchical and, and often patriarchal kinds of uh, in, in institutions. Uh, so that's sort of the key uh, to understanding then Sweden. I don't have enough time. We, we can talk a lot about the United States and Germany, but then I will be hooted off the stage here before I get to the remaining pictures. So I will move on for now. We can go back if, if there's time for question and discussion to talk about that. So one aspect of the moral logic of the Swedish social contract has been just this kind of shift away from um, charity and philanthropy towards taxes and social rights. Right? Uh, th this is very important, I think, to emphasize because today in Sweden, you know, we have, a, I would say, rather naive return to embracing charity and philanthropy. And that, I think, has to do partly with a generational shift. We, we don't, a lot of young people who never experienced Sweden when Sweden was a poor society, uh, so they think of charity as something that gives you a nice, you know, feeling in your belly, and they sort of forget that it's not as nice of a feeling for those who receive a charity. Uh, but for people who are older, yeah, you know, this have more of a collective memory of this, they understand the huge difference between these two projects. And those are, of course, projects intimately related to ideals of fundamental equal opportunity in society, right? Uh, so that all Swedish children and all Swedish citizens should have reasonably good chances to realize their own individual lives, uh, and that should be on equal terms. Um, these ideas, right, of rule of law and individual freedom also have very deep historical roots. Uh, this is an election poster from the Social Democrats in the 1930s. One wish they were still able to think along these lines today. That was a time not unlike our own, right, coming out of the Depression uh, with right-wing racist types of political parties throughout Europe, not just in, not just in Germany. Uh, none, nothing like that here. Why? Because the Social Democrats and the Liberals in Sweden and the other Nordic countries were able to develop their own version, right, of elaborating a story about Sweden, Denmark, Norway. This is here, Svenska folkets väg, folkfriheten och demokratins väg. And then they combine the colors of socialism with the colors of the Swedish flag. Uh, so it was a powerful antidote, right? to right-wing racist nationalism uh, by using, by elaborating a form of democratic nationalism instead. That's something which is today uh, a much more problematic position to take uh, in Sweden with, with, I would argue, very tragic consequences. But here I just want to emphasize that the starting point is so interesting because the Social Democrats then had something which they also lack today, a, a profound historical understanding of what connected them. So they had a ladder here. Yalma yeah, Branting is on the top, but who is at the bottom? Torgny Lagman, you know, he's a guy that probably doesn't really exist, but he represents the rule of law. So he's standing there with his foot on a sword. <laughs> 
Now, if we look at data from our recent trust barometer, uh, where we decided we want to ask uh, questions about what is important to be able to consider someone as a Swede, right? An important question in a t period like we are now with a lot of immigration. And we have heard a lot of people sort of suggesting that Sweden have sort of, it's a kind of racist society and it's like an ethnic identity and so forth. So we had a few questions. Uh, to have ancestors from Sweden, to be born in Sweden, not a big hit. To respect Swedish laws and rules, pretty much everybody. And here Sweden stands apart globally. And here we are quite different, actually, also for Norway and Denmark. Um, but if we compare Sweden, even with an immigrant country like the United States, Sweden is extreme in de-emphasizing ethnic identity and stress what we call a form of civic uh, national identity. So that, of course, is an enormous resource, potentially, uh, today in Sweden. Um, Gender equality, right, which, which is sort of a subspecies of equality, of course, hugely central from a long time back. And this goes back not just, let's say, to the politics of the Myrdal family that we see here, or social democracy, but it's part of a much deeper historical legacy that we sometimes refer to as the m European marriage pattern, where in this part of Europe, right, Going back as early as the 13, 1400s, uh, we see a distinct marriage pattern there. Men and women married late in their mid-twenties at the same age, whereas in, and then lived in basically nuclear families, uh, where they also encouraged an autonomy of their children early. Compared to Eastern, Southern Europe, right, where instead we see a family pattern where men married in their mid-twenties, but the women or the girls were much, much younger uh, and were embedded in these more clan-like family structures, very hierarchical, very patriarchal. So, you know, this kind of tendency towards emphasizing individual freedom, uh, including gender equality, right, has also very deep historical roots. Nonetheless, of course, we have powerful modern reforms, particularly revolutionary was the introduction of individual taxation in Sweden, 1970-71. Go to the United States, you still have, you know, basically family taxation. If you're going to pay your tax in the US, which I did for many years. First question is, are you head of household? Can you imagine that question in the Nordic countries? You'll be hooted out of town. Now, if you answer yes to that question, your next question will be, how many dependents do you have? And for each one, right, you get a slight, you know, you get a tax reduction, right? Try that one in Sweden also. No, our ideal is this one, Pippi. Any social workers in here? All right, so you know what I'm talking about. Who is Pippi? Dead mother, right? Absent father, obviously a social welfare case. <laughs> Yet, she's the strongest girl in the world. Now, you can think of the welfare state as this pot of gold here, right? The idea being, right, that he, every child in Sweden, no matter what the circumstances, right, should be provided with an opportunity to realize herself. Uh, I'm exaggerating, uh, as you understand, but it is, I think, an important idea. Now, a more problematic and demanding aspect of the Nordic social contract is the emphasis on work, the work ethic, the wholesome worker, the skötsamma arbetaren. Uh, this, of course, was an idea that combined liberal notions of individual responsibility with more pop collective ideas about changing society together within, let's say, a popular movement or a political party. Both of them, absolutely central. So the idea, when you look at the Swedish popular movement, uh, the idea was always that you couldn't blame your situation on some kind of structural discrimination or something of that sort, right? You just, no matter how bad your circumstances were, you had to get up in the morning, you know? You know, comb your hair and go to work. And this, of course, if you did that, was an enormous you know, possibility to enter right into uh, the, the social contract. Uh, and this ideal 
you know, we still see it today. We had a question here about what is important for perceiving someone else as trustworthy. I force my colleagues to include the alternative, att vara skötsam, to be, you know, wholesome. And they all told me, look, only old people like you think that that still is important, you know? And, uh, okay, thanks. Uh, so I said, fine, but I'm the, my, I'm the boss here, you know? So we're gonna have the question. And let's let, be, let it be an empirical question. And guess which one was the winner? So this is still very much with us and it's connected to work, right? To, to leave, you know, true information about your economy to the authorities, right? To only call in sick when you really actually are sick, you know, to work and, and you know, for sorry as I well, you know, to make your own money. I mean, what a people, right? These, these, these values are still extraordinarily central. Uh, and they correlate also to questions that are concerned with trust. So those who are in a weaker position in the labor market tend to have lower trust and feel less included in a society and vice versa. Um, now, what I want to end here is then to note that we are in today in a particular dilemma in Sweden because there is another ideal, right, that's outside of this very national notion of the welfare state and the Swedish social contract, namely this alternative uh, understanding of Swedish national identity that comes out of uh, the Second World War, where Sweden had a kind of a morally problematic position, you know, as the Norwegians, I'm sure, can, could tell us much more about, right, troop movement movements through Sweden to northern Germany, trade with Hitler with gold and so forth, iron ore and so forth. Um, but whatever, um, the importance of that, what we see in the post-war period is the emergence, the development of a notion of Sweden as a moral superpower. And uh, it becomes very important, you know, two of, two of the key figures here, Daniel Hammarskjöld, Olaf Palme, you know, were joined by many, many others. And the project of development aid, you know, SIDA, uh, and all of this became very important. Sweden loved the UN, became very involved with, like, idea of human rights and so forth. Uh, we decided to dismantle our defense and instead create a huge structure for development aid. It's very interesting when you look at the non-budget numbers for these two, it forms a kind of a cross. Um, now, for a long time, people thought of those two ideals as essentially compatible. Right? We want to do good things for social justice and solidarity at home, so we made a welfare state. We want to do pretty much the same thing globally, so we believe in human rights. Problem is that they actually operate according to very, very different fundamental logics. Right? The notion of citizenship tied to the nation state you know, is about this tight social contract. You work, pay taxes, claim your rights. You're in plikt, kervinet. It's about reciprocity right? and conditionality. State as an insurance company, fundamentally. And it operates within a bounded nation state. And the details are worked out in this kind of nitty gritty uh, democratic politics where you try to take the taxes in, you know, take into account the demands and then put together a budget. Right? If you look here on the human rights and the globalist side, you see a very different logic. You know? This notion of an intrinsic and universal right that you have, all humans have, by virtue of being humans. And insofar as we are involving ourselves in some form of politics of solidarity, it's based on notions of an unconditional altruism. You know, when a Syrian refugee comes over the border, we don't sort of ask, did you pay Swedish taxes, right? You know, the idea is there's another logic here. And we challenge, right, the nation state. This is, of course, one reason that the democratic left today in Sweden has such a problem with nationalism, right? because they think of themselves as post-national, uh, parts of a global civil society where no borders, right, is a value, moral value that stands above, right, the troublesome emphasis on citizenship and nation state. And then on top of this, these kinds of moral, ethical ideals have become increasingly juridified, right, it's an influence of the American political uh, culture. Uh, so, different conventions dealing with, let's say, children's rights or asylum rights and so forth have become, in certain respect, trump cards, right, in relationship to, to national democracy. Problem with all of these things is that there is no global state. So, everything that is decided over here still has to be realized over here. And that means that these conventions that are disconnected from budgetary constraints over here, they need to be monetized over here.
All right, finally, I'll just give you a couple of pictures here uh, today on, from our trust survey. It will go quick, okay, just to give, a, give an idea. First of all, on, when it comes to generalized trust, it's still very high in Sweden at the aggregate level, but we see big differences, right? So here, Södermalm, where I live, for example, right? Uh, you know, up towards almost 80%. When you go to Rosengård in Malmö, you're down here, right? You're talking 20, 30%. So, and you see yourself the variation here in Sweden. So we have to understand that we cannot, if we want to get to some sort of evidence-based understanding of what's happening in this country, we have to move away from purely national data. Uh, it is also true when we look at community trust, which is a form of trust that is directed towards trusting whether you trust people where you work, where you live, where you operate. We also see a considerable variation. Less dramatic, but still very significant. What is really troubling from my perspective is that what the trends we see now when it comes to perceived safety, trygghet, as we say in Swedish, right? It's hard to translate exactly into English. Uh, what we see here between 2009 and 2017 is a decline, a rise in perceived insecurity in all of the communes that we've studied in Sweden, except for three. Um, and this, of course, is a very troubling measure. It doesn't necessarily mean that there is a huge rise of crime, but there is a perception, which we're going to now compare to actual crime statistics starting actually next week. Uh, and this we see connected also to changes when it comes to the community trust that I mentioned before. It's less pronounced. There's actually a tendency towards a, a certain kind of correction here. So let's say Malmö, for example, I've seen a positive trend. But the general right, pattern is like with uh, the question of security. Uh, so that's what I wanted to say. Just finally, trust and inequality, we see, like many others, very connected. And then the troublesome part, we also see a correlation between diversity and uh, community trust. And that, of course, is an explosive political question, so I'll leave it right there.